Good evening. Um, I'm Robert Haas, and it's my job and pleasure to introduce tonight's um, very special class in the semester of special classes by extraordinary thinkers and doers in the field of um, food, agriculture, and the food movement. Um, we've been talking about problems, and then we started talking about solutions. And um, it's my honor to introduce tonight to, I'm thinking about how to use language that's not inflated for these remarkable people, two visionary thinkers and doers in the field that we've been talking about, you've been thinking about for the entire semester. Alice Waters and Craig McNamara have in common that they are visionary thinkers who were also doers. They both belong to the generation that came of age in the social tumult of the 1960s and 1970s. They're both partially, at least, products of the University of California. Craig McNamara, after a false start at Stanford, found his way to <laughs> UC Davis, and Alice went to UC Berkeley. At the time of tumult around free speech, civil rights, the anti-war movement, Alice was active in the free speech movement in, in Berkeley. Craig, whose father, Robert, a product of the University of California, was Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War, found himself active in the anti-war movement. Both of them graduated. Both of them traveled, Craig in Latin America and Alice in Europe, after college, wondering what they were going to do with themselves. And they both did the one thing that nobody expected people of that generation to do. They went into business. Alice started a restaurant, and Craig started farming up in the Sierra Nevada. Alice is, as you know, the founder of Chez Panisse, the author of the two volumes, The Art of Simple Food, um, the Chez Panisse cookbook, the, uh, and, and several other books. She, among her many honors, besides being receiving the Rachel Carson Award from the Audubon Society for her environmental work, besides being named one of the most important chefs in America, besides being a member of the French Legion of Honor, uh, she was in, in the, she only cook I know of was invested into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She's had a remarkable career, and it's been a career step by step trying to return people to um, what she has called, among other things, a delicious revolution in the way Americans ate, cooked, grow food, bought food, and thought about food. And in addition to the work she's done at Chez Panisse, she's founded two educational organizations through the Chez Panisse Foundation. The Edible Schoolyard, intended to educate kids all over the country and eventually all over the world in how to eat san sanely in relation to the kind of packaged commodification of sort of food that has been sold to children for the last 50 years by corporate interests. And Craig has done a similar thing. He, he, his home base has been Sierra Orchards, uh, a walnut, uh, organic walnut and olive oil working producing ranch where he also has established a, a land base, a center for land-based learning and a California Farm Academy. That is, Alice has been working in the, in the, in the primary grades where kids' uh, food tastes are shaped and Craig working with young farmers at the level of high school and college to educate people about food and culture. We don't need to explain to this class why this is important how remarkable it is and how much these two, with their way of thinking, have begun to shape a massive change that's underway. Our chance to hear the night is great excitement. Alice is going to speak first, and then Craig. So please join me in, in welcoming Alice Waters to our company. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Well, I'm very excited um, to be giving this talk tonight. But first, I would like to um, introduce a special guest. Uh, 
I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce to you Janet Napolitano, who is the president of the University of California. Now, I met her about a year ago, in fact, exactly on January 6th, uh, 2014. She came to Chez Panisse with all of the um, chancellors from all the different campuses of the University of California. It was right before a regents meeting. And um, I thought it would be, uh, it was an historic night. But I never imagined that Janet would stand up at the end of dinner and create a compact for sustainability without any prompting. <laughs> and I even had Michael Pollan there just for insurance. But she stood up and she said, I want to weave food and agriculture into every course of the university. I want to change the buying practices of the University of California. And I want to shout out the best practices to the world. And I can't tell you how hopeful I felt at that time and how hopeful I feel now. Many, many people have been so impressed by the UC Global Food Initiative. And having this happen in the state of California in the greatest public institution, I think, in the world is uh, going to be something extraordinary. And so I hope you will come up, Janet, and say a few words before I speak. I'll be brief because I know we want to hear from Alice and, and from uh, Craig, but uh, the Global Food Initiative, which was hatched at uh, Chez Panisse, has actually uh, spread uh, to all of our campuses uh, through a &R, the Ag and Natural Resources uh, Extension part of the university, and it covers so many, many different areas. And I just wanted to spend a moment or two with you to describe some of the work being done uh, in the initiative and what prompted it. What prompted it not only was a wonderful meal with accompanying libations uh, for dinner, uh, all of which were sustainable, um, but uh, the realization, we started thinking about the university and the role of a public research university in terms of some of the world's grand challenges. Uh, and we have lots of them, uh, energy, uh, water, health. Um, but one of the central ones, and it connects the first three, by the way, is food. And the realization that we will have a billion more people uh, living on the face of the earth uh, by the year 2025, uh, and a billion of those people will go to bed hungry, and another billion will go to bed overweight. Um, so there are daunting numbers, and there are daunting challenges. And that's where the university comes in. We have long been a leader on the food research front, from helping to develop uh, California's world-renowned food production capabilities to enhancing crop yields and different types of crops around the globe. Uh, but it's also about different disciplines, climate studies, economics, uh, social sciences, international law, uh, just to name a few. While the work of the food or the scope of it is global in nature, uh, it also begins right here at home. More than 16% of California households experience a food shortage every night. 16% in a state that is the agricultural center of the most allegedly well-fed nation in the world. Um, 16 million children across the United States live in food insecure households. And we have students right here at the university who suffer from food insecurity. In fact, after uh, some of those challenges uh, were brought to my attention, uh, I allocated 
um, $75,000 to each campus to support food security and access programs, food pantries, and the like uh, at each of our campuses. So, yeah. Um, but uh, our work on the food initiative has, has just begun. Uh, it's a big wheel. Big wheels take a while to get rolling, but once they're rolling, they really pick up momentum. Uh, so the first phase uh, has been completed. That uh, has included identifying best practices on individual campuses and replicating them across the university. It's involved creating toolkits based on the best practices that can be shared outside the University of California. Um, and uh, indeed, we also intend to be global in the reach of those toolkits. Um, we have expanded on the statewide level in terms of how to use data to improve our agricultural practices within the state in light of changing climate uh, conditions. Uh, and we are uh, developing at the national level, I think, better ways to leverage UC's expertise vis-a-vis uh, -vis food and all the subjects related to food uh, as they affect national public policy. So the, um, uh, this course is undertaken uh, in the spirit of learning. Uh, it's undertaken in terms of uh, looking at replication. Uh, and the Global Food Initiative is undertaken in light of the, the role that the university, this university, can play in addressing one of the world's most severe challenges. Our goal is simple, it's straightforward, our mission, to put the world on a pathway to a nutritious, sustainable food future and to get that pathway underway by 2025. An ambitious goal, we can do it, you can do it, it will be a group effort. Uh, but um, group efforts sometimes begin with small dinners at one single restaurant. So thank you all very much. I'm, uh, as I said, really excited uh, to give this speech to you. I have been given, giving it around the world, and I have never given it to students on a campus. And I'm very pleased to do it tonight, and I'm looking for your feedback. So I will begin. In my opinion, all of the serious problems that we face today, obesity and diabetes, addictions, depression, pesticide use, GMO foods, the economy, land use, water use, fair wages for workers, violence, terrorism, poverty, and childhood hunger, the overarching fear of climate change, you name it. All these issues, each and every one, are the outgrowths of a bigger, more encompassing problem. They're consequences of a much more fundamental thing, a deeply rooted condition that provides the soil, if you will, for all of the other issues to grow out of. And unless we deal with this deeper, larger, more pervasive condition. I feel all of our well-intentioned attempts to solve the problems of the world will ultimately fail. It would be like treating the symptoms of a disease without dealing with the root causes of that disease. So what is this deep, pervasive, systemic condition? Eric Schlosser, one of my personal heroes and one of the great muckrakers of our times, has pointed out that in the United States, we live in fast food nation. Fast food is, sad to say, the dominant way people eat in this country. And I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you this. But what I'm not sure many of you realize, and it's something that I've just come to realize myself over the last decade or so, is that fast food 
is not only about food. It's bigger than that. It's way bigger. It's about culture. Fast food not only affects our diets, it also affects our rituals, our traditions, our behaviors, our relationships, expressions, laws, ways of working, systems, and ways of doing things. The effect of fast food doesn't just happen in chain restaurants along freeways or in malls or in airports. It permeates everything from the way that we look at the world to how we operate in it to how we see ourselves, how we express ourselves, to the way we do business, to our architecture, our entertainment, our journalism, to how we treat each other, how we interact with each other, or in many cases these days, don't interact with each other. The clothes we wear, what we buy and sell, our parks, our schools, our politics, and the list goes on. Fast food culture has become the dominant culture in the United States, and I'm really worried that it's becoming the dominant culture in this world. This is the bigger condition, the soil, I feel, that all these other problems are growing out of, fast food culture. You see, like all cultures, fast food culture has its own set of values, and I call them fast food values. And these values saturate our ways of thinking and influence our ways of doing things so thoroughly that in my mind, I don't think we see them anymore. They're just part of the landscape, part of our makeup, part of the biology, our biology at this point. I feel part of our daily lives, and they completely degrade our human experience. An example of a fast food value of our culture is uniformity. The idea that everything should be the same wherever you go. You know, the latte that you get on Durant Street should be exactly like the one that you get in Bogota, or there's something wrong with it. <laughs> Many of us take this for granted. We actually like this. It thrills us. It's modern. It comforts us. But like all fast food values, uniformity uh, uh, has a deeper, darker side. In this case, I would say the pressure to conform, the loss of individuality, or the respect for uniqueness even prejudice and control. All eggs should look alike. All houses should look alike. Everyone should behave in a certain way or they're suspect. Speed is another fast food value. Things should happen really fast. The faster, the better. I have to confess, this is me. You order it, you get it. You want it, you should have it, right then, no waiting. The faster something's done, the better. And when we live like this, I fear that not only do our expectations become warped, but we also become easily distractible. We lose the sense that things take time. The best things take time like growing food, or cooking, or learning, or getting to know someone. These days, if there's not instant gratification, we get frustrated. There's no maturity, no time for reflection, no patience. The faster it's delivered, the faster it's communicated, the more valuable. Time is money. How many cows can you slaughter in the slaughterhouse in one day? How many patients can you see in an hour? How quickly can you down your lunch? Availability. Now that's another fast food value. The idea that we should be able to get anything we want wherever we are, whenever we want it 24-7. You should be able to get Avion water in Nairobi. You should be able to get a peach in Berkeley in April. 
but I know it's better to wait for Moss Masumoto's at Peaches in August. Now, would you please tell Moss I'm waiting. <laughs> this twisted idea of availability to me not only spoils people, but causes them to lose track of where they are in time and space. Seasons stop mattering. What's indigenous to one place becomes unclear, maybe even irrelevant. There's always a feeling that there's something better over there. Local culture and the specialness of what's happening here and now become less important than the big homogenized fast food, get anything you want, anytime global reality, or in my view, unreality. Cheapness, ah. This one drives me crazy. In the United States, there's a complete mixing up of the idea of affordability with cheapness. There's a deep feeling that value is equated with bargains. No one understands the real cost of things anymore because one, nobody tells them, and two, everything is priced artificially, supported by subsidies and corporate sleight of hand and credit. Because I believe in paying people the true cost of their work and their products, people say that I'm artificially driving up the prices of food in markets. And I say it's the discounted prices that are artificial. I feel it's my responsibility to pay the true cost of food if I can. There was a great op-ed in the New York Times last year about this, and I don't know if any of you ever saw it. A small organic farmer described quite eloquently how he and many other farmers he knew need to work one or two extra jobs just to keep the farms going. And he said it was a myth that small farms were, uh, that he knew were making it. Well, I don't think it would be a myth if these farmers were paid appropriately for the beautiful food that they provide to all of us. The truth is, and it's something we need to learn, very, very important, things can be affordable, but they can never be cheap. When I hear somebody say, I just got it cheaper over there, I feel intuitively that somebody somewhere is being sold out, like the farm workers. You cannot not pay for something here and not expect to have other problems over there in your life, like with the environment or with your health or international relations or human rights, for that matter. In the end, all of these deals cost us much, much more, all of us. There are many other fast food values, and I'm sure that you can identify some for yourself. At first, they're invisible, but once you start to notice them, you see them everywhere. It's quite shocking. Part of this is because deception is a fast food value. Everything happens behind closed doors, away from the public's view. And one can't really get a handle on what's truly going on because we don't have access. We have to rely on the presentations or stories that are given to us by the powers that be, ra uh, rather than being able to judge for ourselves. And I worry about all the international trade agreements that are going on these days, out of view, in the name of public good but I know a lot of farmers worldwide that are very, very concerned about the consequences. Work is drudgery. That's another fast food value. Many of us accept this as completely natural. I assure you, though, that work doesn't have to be drudgery unless you're in a system created or supported by a fast food culture. Work in my mind, though difficult at times, should actually provide a sense of value 
and accomplishment, a sense of purpose and satisfaction, a certain kind of pleasure. Fast food culture, by its very nature, for its very survival, strips work of these possibilities. It makes us all believe that work should be something degrading and meaningless, hollow. A job is just something to get through to get the money. And fast food culture bleeds us of our humanity as we work within it. And sadly, as we work inside this culture, we inadvertently strengthen it. And what really gets to me is after convincing us that work is drudgery, fast food culture then provides us with the pleasures to fill this emptiness that dissatisfied work life has left in us. Pleasures like, well, fast food for one, and video games and TV and hours on Facebook and alcohol and drugs and pornography and cruise ships and, and things that I, I like to call consumption vacations. Because I think people just go and they go and gorge themselves and try to make themselves feel better. And it, to fill up this emptiness that sadly can never be filled that way. Basically, the way I see it is that fast food separates work and pleasure in our lives, and then it profits from the separation. More is better. Ah, yes, that's a fast food value. The more you pile on your plate, the happier you'll be. The more massive the store, the better. The more apps you have, the more connected and fulfilled. Basically, the more you have and the more choices you're offered, the better. I find this fast food value so strange because to me, when I have too much stuff or have too many choices, I get overwhelmed and I feel burdened by it. And there's no room for discernment. There's just weight and volume. And at Chez Panisse, we used to be criticized so much for just having one menu. But it was the only way that I could simplify things and guide people towards what I wanted them to taste and to feel and to know. And now people look forward to coming for the menu so they can focus on tasting something that they would never have chosen for themselves, something that surprises them and delights them. Well, some fast food values can be more abstract and elusive, like terminology, for instance, or how it's used or misused and the confusion around it. I mean, what does organic mean these days? Natural, for that matter. What does local mean, really? Or fair trade and fresh? It seems that these terms have been hijacked and they seem to fluctuate and have more to do with marketing and presentation than with any attempt to clarify or inform. And what's scarier is how fast these terms are hijacked. When we find a new term that works for us, like sustainability, well, it gets grabbed immediately by fast food culture and is used everywhere indiscriminately. And in no time, the term becomes cloudy and misleading, if not meaningless. There are many other such slippery terms that I'm aware of. How about pesticide-free or FDA-approved? And how about free-range? Behind the issue of terminology is the issue of standards. What standards are we really using and where did they come from? There seems to be standards, but they don't mean anything. Or worse, they reduce standards. Like food companies who lobby to get chemicals considered natural ingredients in their products. In other cases, it seems to me, we're too willing to compromise or change our standards or abandon them altogether. Now, we serve filtered water at Chez Panisse mainly because we found that what the government considers safe 
we're not so sure about. And take the term grass-fed. You know, this is a term for animals that we're talking about uh, that can be grass-fed only two weeks out of their lives. In so many cases, it's kind of a lie. Another fast food value, dishonesty. Perhaps that's the biggest one of all. I saw a bumper sticker a while ago, and it said, if, we are, if I am what I eat, then I'm fast, cheap, and easy. Well, <laughs> I don't think it could be said any better than that. And so there is a fast food culture, and yet it permeates, and yes, it permeates every aspect of our lives. But fortunately, there is an antidote, and I call it, no surprise, slow food culture. Well, slow food culture is not as flashy or as aggressive as fast food culture, but it's just as powerful and just as enticing. It's a richer, deeper, truly life-affirming and fulfilling culture, one with customs and practices cultivated over centuries since the beginning of civilization. It's a culture connected to nature and one that organizes itself instinctively around nature's cycles and patterns and lessons. It's a universal culture. We've just left it behind. And slow food culture, like fast food culture, has its own set of values. And no surprise, they're called slow food values. You know them innately. Ripeness, aliveness, beauty, awareness, interconnectedness, patience, integrity, community, friendship, honesty, respect. These are civilized, earthbound values, and they grow out of intimate, sensually engaged activities. Through them, we connect to and aspire to create a life and a culture that is naturally nurturing and enriching and joyful and truly sustainable. Fast food values are alien to our beings. They're foisted upon us f from the outside, starting in preschool with the help of advertising and indoctrination. Signs of these values are everywhere, as you know, on our televisions, in our freeways, and along the airports, in our homes, in our aesthetics. But thankfully, Slow food values are intrinsic to us. We're born with them. They're part of our bodies, part of our biological makeup, at the very core of our essence. Slow food values are actually the things that guide us to behave in ways that make our lives meaningful and compassionate. They've just been covered up deadened by the assault of fast food culture around us. And when we eat fast food, we ingest these values of the fast food culture, and it changes our behavior, our structures, and it changes our lives. So this is why I believe so profoundly in edible education. So by placing food and food concerns at the center of the curriculum of the whole school, exposures to slow food values happens naturally and democratically in the course of each student's day. A new kind of living and learning becomes, as Michael Pollan might say, second nature to all students. And the best news of all, if you ask me, is that schools can create sustainable support networks beyond themselves. Think about it. Think about it. 20% of our population goes to school. Imagine what would happen if we adopted sustainable criteria for the buying of the food 
in the whole public school system, including the universities. Not only would we be educating the next generation into a new, delicious way of eating and learning, but the schools themselves and the universities would become alternative economic engines for the farms and the ranches surrounding them. And they would automatically provide political and social support system for farm workers across the nation. And the core of this, its very foundation, has to be a radically reimagined school lunch program. One with no fast food concessions in sight. One where every child gathers together around a table of free, sustainable, delicious, and nutritious school lunch offered to every child. Eating this way would not only encourage the expression of slow food values in every student's life, but it would teach them every day that, they, that the way they feed themselves is just as important and integral to their lives as anything that they are learning in school. It would show them in a profound way that they're deeply cared for. Now, Gloria Steinem, she said something to me uh, a number of years ago that really empowered me. She said, public education is our last truly democratic institution. And I know she's right. Everyone goes to school or should. It's our common place in our culture where we can reach every student while they're still open and learning. It's our place of equality in this country. It really is, or it should be. And I feel deep in my heart that schools are the place where we can make deep and lasting change. And we can make this by going right through the cafeteria door. So thank you. Thank you. coming forward here. <laughs> Good evening. And Bob, thank you for that very kind and generous introduction. Um, and thank you all for this uh, wonderful opportunity to be here with you this evening. It's a tremendous honor. I, uh, I think my favorite spot is the UC system. And uh, I, I love coming to Berkeley. Uh, I graduated from UC Davis, so that has a special place in my mind as well. President Napolitano, you have often mentioned uh, that the food arena is a big tent, and you couldn't be more accurate. It's, it's a tremendous one. And in California, whether you come from NorCal or SoCal or the Inland Empire or the coast, we have to remember that we are one state. We are facing incredible challenges, and the more that we can do this together, we will be able to address our very complex issues that involve food insecurity, as you mentioned, food waste, climate change, um, with the goal of ensuring a healthy, sustainable food system for all of us. And Alice, you opened your delicious revolution, your remarks, uh, referring to a deeply rooted systemic condition that you said provides the soil from which all things are nourished. And as a farmer, I can't think of a better way, uh, a better metaphor than to begin this evening's uh, discussion and, and conversation with you all. I want to take a moment to read a passage about soil and ask you to think while I'm reading it, who might have written this and, and when was it written? Can you hear me if I stand out here? 
The soil is the mother of us all, plants, animals, and men. The phosphorus and calcium of the soil build our skeletons and nervous systems. Everything else our bodies need, except air and sun, comes from the earth. Nature treats the earth kindly. Man treats her harshly. He overplows the cropland, overgrazes the pasture land, and overcuts the timberland. He destroys millions of acres completely. He pours fertility year after year into the cities, which in turn pour what they do not use down the sewers, into our rivers, and into our oceans. The flood problem, in as, insofar as it is man-made, is chiefly the result of overplowing, overcropping, and overtimbering. This terribly destructive process is excusable in a young civilization. It is not excusable in the United States. We know what can be done, and we are beginning to do it. As individuals, we are beginning to do the necessary things. As a nation, we are beginning to do them. The public is waking up, and just in time. In another 30 years, it might have been too late. That was U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace in 1938, published in the Yearbook of Agriculture of that same year and entitled Soils and Men. Now, I know that we could change that title significantly <laughs> now, but think of what was going on in our nation in terms of soils during the 30s with the Dust Bowl. It was an incredibly uh, challenging time. And as we think forward and today think back of what that was like so it'll help us to solve the, the, the problems of the future. In his final sentence of his introduction, Henry Wallace said, the social lesson of soil waste is that no man has the right to destroy soil even if he owns it. That's incredibly profound. So, soil really is the mother of us all. And what we're realizing today is that soil might just be the solution to our changing climate. One teaspoon of good soil contains over a billion living organisms, and their health determines the health of our entire planet. 99.7% of our food comes directly from soil. Demonstrating the importance of this, the United Nations has proclaimed uh, 2012 the, year, the International Year of Soils. And yet, as a society, we are what ecologist um, David Wolf has termed subterranean impaired. And I think that's, that's a good, I, I don't think we've touched the soil enough. I don't think we have a communication with the soil and we need to do that. So I'd encourage you tonight to start that process. I know that Moss and Nikiko and Steve Glissman and others who have talked with you have talked a lot about soil health. So I won't dwell on that so much tonight, but while we're talking about the really important things of climate change, of food insecurity, drought, and food waste. I want you to be thinking of the importance of soil. You know, and I know, that climate change is rapidly and radically changing our environment. We've experienced more frequent uh, drought years in the last two decades than we have in the past centuries. We've also, through um, tree, tree monitoring, we know that uh, last year was the driest year in 1,200 years. And our worst droughts have occurred when conditions are both dry and warm, and the prediction for the future is that this will be occurring more frequently and with greater intensity. Have a look at this graphic here. Over on your left is um, a graph representing Sierra snowpack in the last 30 years of the last century. The middle frame is representing what snowpack might be like at the end of this century, the last 30 years of this century, should temperatures increase by three to five percent. And this one here represents what snowpack in the Sierras might look like at the end of the century if temperature rises between five and eight degrees. And what we're seeing there is a tremendous reduction in snowpack. This is what, it, it just a visual, it, it kind of got me when I saw it, shows where we've been and where we're heading in, in 35 years. What this means to me is that our ability to store water will be compromised significantly. Just last week, you probably read that the Sierra snowpack was estimated at 6% of normal. This will have an incredible impact on California agriculture this year. 42% of California's irrigated farmland will, will, will receive, will, will have water cutbacks of 80% or more. Let me say that again. 42% of California's farmland 
will have cutbacks of irrigated water 80% or more. That will equal fallowing of about 620,000 acres of ag land. Last year that figure was about 400,000 acres of ag land. At a loss of 23,000 jobs, those are our farm worker jobs, and last year we had lost 17,000. At a total economic loss for the state of California of almost six, $6 billion. Last year our loss was about $2 billion. And yet we've been stuck in an argument about the amount of water that agriculture uses and the factoid that it takes a gallon of water to produce an almond. Let me be very specific. Of all the water that our state receives from rain, snowpack, the Colorado River, agriculture uses 41% to irrigate 9 million acres of our cropland. Urban and human use is 10%. The remaining 50% is for our environment, for our endangered species, runs off as runoff, gets absorbed, and goes to the oceans. And just to put the issue of water used to produce an almond into perspective, it takes 35 gallons of water to produce a head of broccoli. I like broccoli. It takes 50 gallons of water to produce a cantaloupe. It takes 168 gallons of water to produce that wonderful rosy red uh, watermelon that we all enjoy. 2,113 gallons of water to produce a pair of shoes. And you remember that latte that you talked about this morning? That was 53 gallons of water. Not to mention the eight and a half gallons of water that it takes to produce the microchip. And my computer, your computer, has hundreds of those. What we're realizing is we are facing an epidemic drought. We're, we're facing this epidemic, um, and we're basically running out of water. We have to think creatively today and all join together uh, and take dramatic steps to divert a collapse of, of California agriculture as we know it. To understand how the simple choices that we make each day affect our soil and water, let's turn to an issue that I'm particularly passionate about, which is food waste. It takes an incredible amount of resources to grow our food across the country. 80% of our fresh water, 50% of our land, a huge amount of our energy. And you know what? You're probably aware that we're wasting 40% of our food, and it just makes no sense because what happens is, when we throw food away, we're wasting um, our precious water resources, we've wasted 4% of our energy, and we've created 15% um, of our methane, one of the worst greenhouse gases, at a cost annually of $165 billion. Now, there's good news, and that is we are changing that, we can change that. This photograph is a picture of a leafy green harvest, it could be spinach or lettuce or maybe a cru crucifera in the Salinas Valley. And you know that all those culls that typically do not get harvested, you can actually see them in this photograph, or what we call ugly fruits and vegetables. Now farmers are, are harvesting them. You can harvest your primary product in one, one box, the premium product, and at the same time you can be packing your cull or your, your ugly fruit in a second one. You can prearrange with the California Association of Food Banks to have a refrigerated truck right at the edge of that field and get that food to the people who need it the most. When I grew up, Food banks primarily had canned foods. Today, 50% of foods in California food banks come from vegetables, fruits and vegetables. So it's a, a tremendous uh, incentive. As a matter of fact, speaking of incentives, as a, a grower today, if I donate foods, I can receive a 10% tax incentive. And we're trying to move forward a bill right now to increase that to 20% and have it uh, cross over all types of foods. The second level of food loss, so we've got farm to table, losing 40%. The second area of food loss is at our retail. You know that bountiful display that looks so beautiful, and I, I, I go and I pick up that, that wonderful peach or that, Alice, you referred to, or that pear or tomato. Well, the one right next to it that I didn't pick is probably going to go into the um, trash. 600 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables out of every grocery store across the nation. That's the average. And what we've been doing is we've been throwing them into landfills, creating that methane. This picture, I think any of us would have taken any of these fruits and vegetables home 
absolutely lovely. Where they were headed to was a company called California Safe Soils in West Sacramento, turned into a liquid fertilizer that I just put on our, I put into our buried drip irrigation for our walnuts last week. We're, we're an organic walnut operation. What an incredible win-win. It's a savings for the grocery store, it's a, it's a business for the people who are producing it, and it's a wonderful nourishing uh, element for what we do on the farm. Now maybe you're as flummoxed as I am by expiration dates. I actually call it the dating game. Who the hell knows what's going on here? It was done for a good reason, for internal purposes in the store to manage uh, commodities, but you got to sell by date, you got to best by date, you got to use by date. The only date you can really do is a sniff test to figure out if your milk carton expired yesterday, are you just going to throw it out? And maybe your refrigerator begins to look a little bit like mine sometimes, and that, pro, that poor little clamshell in the back with the strawberries looks like this. The worst thing we can do, con true confessions here, before I, I was aware of this, is to throw it away in the trash, in the clamshell. That goes to the landfill, that creates the methane, and it's hugely expensive. The average family is losing between $1,300 and $2,200 a year. Alice shared with me a wonderful um, resolve for the restaurant business. You know when you go to a restaurant and you get these huge portions um, that create all the problems that you addressed with about in fast food. And it's not just fast food. Um, I believe you said, Alice, why not serve an appropriately sized portion? You, so you have your menu, you've got your prices, it's going to cost me $18.95 for that menu. Serve, serve a portion that, that fits me. And if I would like a second, I ask for a second and I'm served a second. Now that would be something simple that we could do and really makes a difference. I want to share with you a very quick video, it's one minute, it really says... We grow and produce enough food for everyone on the planet, yet there are 870 million hungry people on the planet and two and a half million children die of malnutrition every year. Worldwide, we produce 27% more food per person today than we did 50 years ago, even as the global population has more than doubled. Yet in Europe and North America, each consumer weighs 210 to 250 pounds of food per year. As millions of people go to bed hungry, half of the food produced in the United States is wasted between the farm and the fork, discarded as a result of the inefficiency in the human-managed food chain. In the U.S., nearly 8% of the food is lost in production. The food industry loses 4%, supermarkets are responsible for 6%, restaurants contribute 15% of the food in the landfills, households throw away nearly 25% of the food they buy. The cost of this waste is about $165 billion annually. That's more than five times as much as we spent on foreign economic aid in 2011. This waste doesn't only affect people, the environment suffers from it as well. Did you know throwing away one gallon of milk is like throwing away 1,000 gallons of water? That's because it takes that much fresh water to produce one gallon of milk. A quarter of our water used for irrigation is used on food that is wasted. So when you throw away your food, you are throwing away all the water that it takes to grow, produce, and ship it as well. On top of that, an estimated 16% of methane emissions from our landfills are caused by food waste. By saving 15% of the food we normally throw away, we can feed more than 25 million Americans every year. If we start paying attention to what we waste, we can end up saving a lot more than just leftovers. As President Napolitano mentioned, at the opposite end of the spectrum of food waste is food insecurity, and it's a tragedy. It, 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 in this incredible state of ours that provides over 50% of our nation's fresh fruits and vegetables and 14% of our, our nation's exports, it's inexcusable that, as you mentioned, almost 50 million people across to our neighbors across the nation and 16 million children are food insecure, that they're going to our schools to attempting to learn. That means that they don't have the resources to buy a meal or they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And right, right here in Alameda, it's almost 16% overall, 20% are children. That's 236,000 people and 70,000 children right here. Our people, our children, in our schools. As you mentioned, in the state of California, it's about 6.1 million, 2.5 million children. Um, our food insecure. This is a tragedy and, and it, we absolutely uh, must end it and I think we can. And uh, you, you, we might ask ourselves, how can we do that? Who, and who will grow tomorrow's food for, for everyone? And I think the answer is you. I think it might just be you. 
Um, at the Center for Land Based Learning, you mentioned it, Bob, we've been um, training young people to be incredible, um, knowledgeable stewards of the environment and great community leaders. And just four years ago, we started the California Farm Academy to answer the call that Secretary Vilsack, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack made, saying that we need 100,000 new farmers and we need them today. We've graduated over um, 58 beginning farmers, 46 of whom are now farming, and another 20 are in training just as we speak, and they're doing all sorts of things. Some came from family farms and are going back with new technologies and new ideas. Some are starting their own farms, but it's expensive. Land in our area is $25,000 an acre. It's very, almost impossible to purchase. Um, but many of our students are creating urban gardens, and I'm very excited to say that in the Sacramento region, we now have six or seven urban gardens that are uh, created by our, our students. You can see some of them here. Some of the vegetables, this was just a corner lot, vacant, uh, uh, actually not vacant, it was a dump site and turned into a, uh, an incredible uh, productive um, market and actually connecting people from diverse backgrounds to healthy sustainable food supply. You see some of our farmers and volunteers painting a tool shed which also serves as a farmers market stand. And I'm really excited to say that Sacramento, a few years ago, claimed itself as the farm to fork capital of the nation. So uh, anytime you want to come up to Sacramento and join our farm to fork movement, we'd love to have you. Because agriculture is both um, a source and a solution to our problems, we need it to be a leader in solving climate change and in food insecurity and wasted food. And I think we're at a spot where we really need to reward farmers uh, who are helping to solve these problems because farmers manage a tremendous amount of land across the nation. But we also need the public to be engaged and to, to take ownership of these issues. This crisis belongs to all of us. Our water and our soil are our most precious resources and we must work together to ensure a sustainable future for our planet. And that's why we're here tonight. You are the best and the brightest uh, thinkers and doers. And I can't think of a better place for visionaries like you to be than, in a, than at an Edible Education 101 seminar tonight. The solution to healthy soils and vibrant planet really is in our own two hands. And so what I ask you to do is to put them together tonight and work with us to create this future that we all want. Alice said it very well, and it's a choice. And uh, I really look forward to our conversation here. I've also invited you, uh, your peers, up to see us on the farm. Many of your classmates in other classes have come up. I would encourage you, we're, we're just an hour away. And uh, we need you, we desperately need you. you you add so much to our lives. Uh, my wife and I have three children, a 30-year-old over in the city, a 27-year-old son who came back to the farm, and a 23-year-old daughter. And this last harvest, I finally, Sean uh, worked with me during the harvest, and on the second day, everything that could break down, broke down. And my first reaction was complete embarrassment. Here's my son, he sees me at my absolute worst, and then I realized, wait a minute, this is a good way um, to begin, and I was finally able to say, you know, we really need you, um, and, we, and I'll exp I, I, I share that with you, we really need you. So thank you so much, I look forward to our discussion right now. Are we going to, are we going to? All the way over here. I'm going to get a little glass of water. So how have the walnuts been? Uh, good. Organic walnuts. And, and, and there's fruit They're on there. the stage. And if you haven't oh, yeah. tasted you're the walnuts, welcome to. please get up and enjoy them. Yes. So where do we begin? <laughs> where, where do you want to begin? How, how about beginning with what people always say to this is, this is a good idea, but it's too expensive, and the corporate agricultural system is feeding people. Oh, that's my favorite question. <laughs> that's my favorite question, um, especially in the light of the health crisis that we're facing. I mean, just on that alone, uh, the billions of dollars uh, to 
to take care of all the people who are diabetic and, and have the issues of obesity. I mean, it's just unimaginable. But it's the same way in, in terms of the environment, the destruction of the environment. Everything is, is just um, costing us. And, uh, and I, we need to come back to our senses and decide that we're going to, you know, pay to change, to educate children when they're young. And I, I think we have to begin in kindergarten. That's where we begin. And they're so open and sensitive and, and ready to take that. I mean, I've been um, working with kids in middle school for the last 20 years. And I can't tell you the kind of change that goes on when children are engaged with, with um, uh, reconnected to nature. And at first, you know, it's a little resistance. Uh, I know I don't want to get my, my, my shoes dirty and uh, all of that. And within, uh, really, um, uh, a couple of weeks, they just are engaged. And that's what's happened at the Edible Schoolyard Project is that we're uh, using the lab of the garden and the lab of the kitchen classroom to teach every academic subject. And I, th I think we just have to begin there uh, in kindergarten, actually in preschool. Well, that, that really, I mean, you touch upon the nature deficit disorder yeah. that, that really is present at, at all ages. And Alice, you've done such a, a, a wonderful job of, of bringing this to all ages. But you know what? You have to deal with the old fart farmers like me, too. We need new education. And we need, we, we, we're using tremendous amounts of technology as an organic farmer. Um, First and foremost, I, I, I'm in the business. I, I can't be here tonight if I'm not profitable and if I'm not taking care of the planet and I'm not taking care of the people that work on the farm. But the opportunities that we have ahead of us to change are significant and there's just no, we have no choice. We're, we're now at a conundrum where we have to change. Well, I'm, I'm just, um, I, I think it's so abstract uh, for people to hear about what's happening on the farm and to, to think about these ideas. Uh, I, 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 it, it just it kind of doesn't make sense in a fast food culture. And so we need to go out there to your farm. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I, I just can never forget when I went out to Craig's farm one time because he said that I had to climb up and look at the baby owls in in the, owl box. the owl box that was above. And I climbed up this ladder, this precarious <laughs> ladder up to the top, and I looked in there. And it just took my breath away. I mean, all of these little tiny owls just all looking, <laughs> looking back at me. And I just, I just immediately fell in love with them. I, I, I just couldn't. Take my, I didn't want to come down. But Alice, why were they there? The owls are there because we can't use pesticides to kill our rodents, and I've got to kill the um, gophers and the rodents if I want a crop. Owls will catch their weight in voles and moles and mice. I, mice. I had no idea how many, <laughs> how many do they have to catch a night to feed all those little babies? A lot. I mean, a lot. I, I mean like, how many did you say? Like something like each mother had to catch. 25 or something like that. <laughs> Can you imagine to feed those babies? But uh, it's that kind of experience, and it's it's like it's like eating something when you're young, and you taste something like a a raspberry off the bush, and you're out there, and you you just eat like that, and you want to go back there again, and you begin to see that you you. That's why I call it a delicious revolution, mm. because this isn't hard to do. Mm. We just have to create the circumstances within a school 
where students can actually put, feel it and smell it and listen to it and, and, and taste it. And, and then they, they, they want to go back yeah. again. Yeah, we've really experienced that with high school kids. I love, I love that high school time in our lives because it's a serious time. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a time of tremendous growth, and to bring people out from all walks of life to the farm and to make that connection, um, it, it is truly a life-changing experience. And you know, almonds, as we said earlier, have become kind of the poster child. Well, walnuts could be there too, and you have to ask yourselves, why are we in this predicament today? Well, one of the things is you, the eaters, have asked us to ha produce high-quality protein foods, and we've done that. So we've eliminated some of our cotton, a lot of our cotton. We're eliminating some of our alfalfa across this state, and we're beginning to grow walnuts and almonds and higher value products so that we can do what you said early on, Alice, which is to have a profit and be profitable so we se can send our kids to public education and afford the things that, that families need to do. So, it's a very complex world, and I, I would encourage you to uh, really search when you, when you ask a question or when you formulate an opinion, to really think it through and engage in somebody who has the opposite opinion. I frequently am forced to do that, and it it's challenges us. Uh, no. No, uh, I was just going to say, though, that, that uh, we're asking people to eat with intention. Yes. And, and when you do that, the rewards are so great. I mean, it's not like homework that, no. <laughs> that you're struggling to do. You go to that farmer's market and you immediately feel good by being there. And you begin to engage with the people who are around and selling mm -hmm. the food and being there. And, and, and then you buy things, and you bring them home, and you taste them, and, and it, you want to go back there again. And it, it's a complete learning experience. It's a way that you can win over just about everybody. So. <coughs> it's April, and I want to change the <laughs> subject slightly, because in my line of work, seniors start coming into my office in April and I say, what are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. And they roll their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how, how you, the, the, they're taking this course, they've taken courses in which they've seen what the situation of biodiversity is on the planet, they've taken courses in which they've seen what the problems of energy and climate are on the problem. How did you find your way to your work? Really, by, by tasting. I went to France at this time when I was a student at Cal in my junior year. And uh, I went to Paris. And I was very lucky because at that time in France, it really was a, a slow food culture. And I, had, I felt like I'd never eaten before. I went and had a baguette and some apricot jam. And I, I just uh, I just wanted that again the next day. <laughs> and I was willing to stand in line and wait for it. And, and then I went to the little restaurants, and they were filled with, with friends of friends. And, and uh, we would have this wonderful conversation at the table. And I, I came back home, and I wanted to live like the French. And so I... That's how it began. I mean, very naively, in terms of opening the restaurant. I thought, well, there's no place to eat in this town, and what if I opened a little restaurant? All my friends could come and eat there instead of at my house, and I could make money, and you know, all of this. And of course, once I opened the restaurant, I never saw my friends again. <laughs> <laughs> Except I ended up hiring my friends. Mm. Now, that was a beautiful thing, because everybody told me, Never hire your friends, you know, what's going to happen when they don't do it right, you're going to have to fire them. But I never had that experience. I mean, I've just always loved uh, working with people that I, I have a lot in common with. 
I, you, you farmed for a couple of years in the interview, I said, and it practically broke you and you found your way to walnuts. Yeah, it, it was true. <laughs> I, it, and the way I got to farming was in that tumultuous time of the early 70s, I, as you said, I left college. I was very disenfranchised. It was so difficult. And uh, work. I, just, I worked on farms, on peasant farms, through Mexico, through Central America, and through South America, and discovered that, that food is political. And for me, it brought these two worlds that seemed quite separate together, and I wanted to become a farmer, and went to Davis to study agriculture. And upon graduating, had a, had a thin degree, and no experience, really, to speak of, and I found the most wonderful um, mentor, Tan Lam, a Chinese farmer, who put me under his wing. Oh my goodness, I don't know why he did it. I made so many mistakes, as many mistakes as you could possibly make, and um, started a, a fresh uh, produce operation right on Route 80 at Dixon. We were trucking produce into the uh, wholesale terminals here in San Francisco and produce back east, and it just broke me as a beginning farmer. Now remember, the late 70s, there were very few farmers markets. There didn't exist CSAs. The idea of a chef like Alice was just getting going and there wasn't a huge market for us, so we were getting killed in the marketplace. And I said, I want to be a farmer, but I've got to do it a different way. Um, something that's less perishable, fewer harvests a year, a, a, a commodity that I would have more control over. And I thought, gee, that's a walnut. I'd never <laughs> even looked at a walnut tree before. Um, so my wife and I, uh, purchased a, an orchard in 1980, and we've been harvesting 34 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a wonderful, wonderful trajectory. And the beauty is to produce something that is healthy, sustainable, has satiety. And uh, you know, the Chinese refer to the walnut as a brain food. Well, you can kind of see it in the cranium look on it, but it is a brain food. It's, it's filled with antioxidants and omega-3 fatty acids, and it uh, gives you life. That wouldn't it be fantastic if, uh, if a whole school system wanted your walnuts? I mean, yeah. I mean to give you the security you yeah. needed to do that job that you do, <coughs> raising that precious food. And you and I have a friend who's <laughs> doing that, Rodney Taylor, who is at the Riverside uh, School District. He's in charge of all of the food procurement. And I think he's done that with citrus and a few other things. Alice. But it could be done with mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. And it could give great yeah. encouragement for people who wanted to farm. Yeah. I mean, it would be amazing. And tremendous food for right. learning. I mean, that's what happened with Chez Panis. Uh, I wasn't, at the time, really looking for local sustainable growers. But I was looking for taste. Mm -hmm. And what happened? was that I ended up at the doorsteps of the local sustainable growers. And then we became friends, and I was willing to pay whatever price because it made the food at Chez Panisse delicious. And then I ultimately let them decide what food we were going to use in the restaurant. I didn't dream up the menu and then go order the food. They told me what they had, and I bought it for the restaurant. Mm. And it's, uh, a it was a great revelation to me uh, to uh, uh, understand the, the role of the farmer in, at, in, in, the, in the restaurant. That's the most valuable person. Mm. In, in the books about your work, they often say that you didn't just find but created farmers by encouraging certain kinds. Is this Well, I think that's or? <laughs> well, there's a lot. Uh, something amazing happened uh, uh, way, well, now it's almost 30 years ago. My father um, uh, saw that I was struggling to find... Um, to bring in all the different uh, produce from all the different farmers around. And he suggested that he find somebody within an hour of Chez Panis who was willing to grow the food for us. And he went up to Davis 
and asked for all of the organic farms within one hour of the restaurant. And he and my mother went traveling around California and uh, uh, visiting them all. And he came back and he presented three people to us. And he said, but we've already chosen one. <laughs> and that was Bob Kennard, uh, who has spoken here at the Edible Education course. And I, I uh, would really recommend that you listen to his, uh, his uh, talk last year, because he's an extraordinary farmer. And my father chose him because he thought that he was crazy and uh, that uh, we would be the only one who could really appreciate what he was, he was doing. Uh, because my father came from the 50s where all the crops were in rows and you could see them all out there. And Bob, uh, it was a field of what looked to my father like weeds. Mm. And then he went out there and pulled them aside, and there were these beautiful, perfect cauliflowers. And, uh, and uh, Bob told my dad that it was, he was allowing the soil to be all that it could be for the plants. And that's what gave them the nourishment. And that's why they were, in his mind, 10% more nourishing than anybody else's plants. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. And he, he always talked to, him, uh, uh, talked to us as if, you know, the plants are, it's like a family. That, that if the family loves the child and gives the child all that he needs to be who he would like to be, then that's what will happen. That child will grow up to be that way, and that's what the soil gives to that crop. And that carrot can be. And, that, and that's why we've, we've moved the to best no, taste to no no till. No till. <laughs> I was going to ask you about when you started farming. Uh, was organic an idea for you? Was sustainable an uh, that's idea a, for you? That's a wonderful question, and it was incredibly challenging. I, I feel that I came out of college with uh, tools to do the job, and as I mentioned, the competition was very significant. And I embraced more of the, <coughs> the treadmill that I had learned, and it took me about 10 years to transition and to really find the mentors, because that, that field that you described, Alice, was not it, honestly, I'm kind of a neat nick a little bit, and I, I kind of do like things to be in rows, and I realized, okay, Craig, you've got to really relearn things here. And as we've all said tonight, and I know you believe, it is the soil. It's the richness, oh. those billions of microorganisms. And so we have to uh, enrich that culture in everything we do. So it was a new learning curve for me. I made lots of mistakes. Um, by the way, those are all, all part of who we are. Um, I make, make them all the time, but um, it was a, it, it probably, it probably took me, well of course the transition to organic is three technical years, but it probably took me ten years. Wow. And uh, I think, I'm sure the I'd love to class has lots of questions, yeah. so why don't we go there Let's right now. <laughs> um, would you like to join the conversation and talk to Craig and Alice? Uh, we have a question from uh, social media. Um, what are some of the best daily practices to address the California drought on the farm and in food service? Great question, and that's what we should all be thinking about. Um, I think the video that we showed in one minute just really concisely put it in mind for me. So when, we, when, when we're at home, um, be very, very thoughtful about the water that we're consuming. I, I, I spent a lot of time in Latin America in the countries that were frequently dry, and so you know, t uh, just the amount of time that you, you spend in the shower, washing dishes, drinking water, whatever it is. So to be incredibly mindful of what we're doing every day. I saw in the paper that the average lawn, the average house lawn, 100,000 uh, gallons of water a year. I went, oh my God, I mean, we, ha we have to, we, we have to change everything we do. I've got to change the way I eat. I, I really enjoy meat. I, I do half of the shopping in our family and half of the cooking, and I load up on that. I have to be aware of that. You saw 
once again, how many gallons it takes to grow the various uh, things that we enjoy as a, as a society. So in, in food service, I thought the idea that Alice had of, of reducing portions, the amount of food that gets thrown away at restaurants, it, 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 it's staggering. And the only uh, thing that assuages my guilt is we have chickens. Uh, I encourage everybody to get chickens because then whatever you don't eat other than meats goes out to the chickens. That'd be the take home. <laughs> well, we, we take all of our uh, compost uh, yeah. back up to the farm. And so we drive it up there and bring back the vegetables. So it's a beautiful yeah. cycle. Um, uh, I'm not sure that, that we could probably afford to give everybody seconds on all the food. <laughs> <laughs> no, but m right. most people aren't going to well, are going to ask. Uh, it's you don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, would you guys ask for a second? I mean, it's the problem with delicious food. If you made the food less <laughs> desirable, you'd be. So I'm not problem. suggesting that the first portion be weensy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I always ask for half portions myself, and that's something. Alice, uh, you seem very optimistic about uh, public school system taking on this cause. Uh, I, would, I would just ask you to expand upon um, what changes you think would hap have to happen in the public school systems in order for this to be uh, a possibility and also equitable across you know, economic uh, demographics. Well, I, um, I'm asked this question all of the time. Uh, and I think the easiest way to make something happen is to have somebody at the top uh, uh, insisting that it happen. And I think back to the precedent of Kennedy when we had a physical fitness uh, 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 issue in the, in the, in the 60s. Well, that was in the 50s, actually. When we, pardon me? When? Early 60s. Early 60s. Good. Um, and we weren't physically fit as a nation for mm -hmm. the new frontier. And so Kennedy decided that we should put physical fitness into every school in the nation. And he cheer-led for that. And he made himself an example uh, and gave awards and, and got every agency in Washington to be part of that effort. And he didn't put a whole lot of money to it, but he put a whole lot of enthusiasm and rightness to it. And we built gymnasiums, and we hired teachers, and we made physical fitness part of the core curriculum in really every school in the United States. And the problems and the issues are so grave right now that I can't imagine that we couldn't launch a campaign for edible education in the public schools. And especially with the needs of children, uh, the, the, the health issues and the hunger issues are so dire that wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to feed every child at school for free? Mm -hmm that they would all come around the table. And at the same time, you're giving the money to the farmers who are taking care of the land. So you're bringing the values of the farmers into the schools. And the schools begin to change. Mm -hmm. So your speech, I was mainly based on talking about how fast food is pretty much a root of many other issues correlating with it. Um, but my, my question is more so is, um, and you said this is your first speech to students, so you're open to a little criticism. So I'm, I'm ready to hear it. I'll try to be respectful. <laughs> um, you you it's, don't have to be. <laughs> it's, um, are we also taking into account just uh, the rise of other things that are more so contributing to this fast culture, like the rise of internet and the much faster forms of communication? I mean. Obviously, we'd like you know, to slow down and everybody be able to have their own local garden and know where the food comes from, but I mean, we just live in a very fast, you know, 
results-driven society where that's just not possible. I mean, everything from getting your sales numbers to us needing to get high SATs to get into this university. And so, I mean, do you see a way, the solutions, maybe we can do a hybrid, maybe we can make fast food healthier and then also incorporate, you know, better preparation of people bring their own meals. I mean, um, I'm just more so asking, like, what, what, what solutions you offer? Um, because I think just slowing down, I think it's pretty hard just based on the overall world culture that we've created amongst ourselves. Well, I think that, um, that we're part of that fast food culture, and it's doing a kind of damage that we can't even begin to imagine. I mean, we're destroying the land that feeds us. So it's not, it's not um, a kind of uh, a choice between a computer and, and taking care of the land. And we, we have to take care of the land. We have to do that. And I, I'm just saying that in doing that, you're opening up your senses, and those are the pathways into your mind. And you're opening yourself up to the beauty around yourself. And it's something that you can't get off a computer or holding that phone all of the time. You have to touch it. And I'm, I'm a, a Montessori teacher in training, from training. And I really believe that we have to educate the whole child or we're going to become inhuman. We're going to become robotic. I feel like we're already in that place where we're hoping we're going to get everything, including love, from an iPhone. <laughs> and, and you're just all the time uh, uh, checking to see whether somebody's loving you. <laughs> and, you know? And I, I, the, the thing about it is that, that even the validation that comes on, on, on you know, Facebook and all of that, it, it, it doesn't fill that need you have inside you. And so I'm just saying that we need to put away the electronics when we come to school and figure out how to use them in a way that, that is... Um, Uh, beneficial. <laughs> beneficial, <laughs> exactly. And that we have to be, you know, begin in kindergarten to fall in love with nature. And that when 85% of the kids in this country don't eat one meal with their family, we are not having that conversation at the table. We're not passing on a real culture to our children. And what's in the fast food? I can't even begin to, to talk about that. I mean, I think you know. And it's caused the most shocking health problems. Okay, I think that was a really respectful question. Thank yeah. you. Um, and yes. I think we need to say, why do we do things fast? And I'll, I'll have a chef fast off in terms of, I bet I can make a meal that I call healthy, wholesome, everything that you've supported, Alice, in a very short period of time. Um, now, I may go to Trader Joe's and get the no, butternut squash pre-cut no, pre, pre, pre up. No, you don't. I don't? Okay. You don't go to no, wait, Trader wait, wait, Joe's. Wait, wait, wait. No? No. 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 I, we, 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 do, we, do, we do sell our walnuts to Trader Joe's. Okay. But... <laughs> I don't shop there. Boy, okay. I'm going down on this well, one. You are going down on that okay, one. so okay. you get the whole butternut squash. Um, but wouldn't you rather that I bought my walnuts directly from you, and yeah. you don't have to have a middleman who's trying to buy your yeah. walnuts at a lesser price? And possibly blending them with others. And walnuts. blending them with others. Yeah. No, yeah. just yeah. sell them directly yeah. to me. Okay. See, I'm on a big learning curve here, too. Uh, and so that's the way I can find the least expensive food. Yeah. Not cheap, no. but affordable. 
is buying directly mm -hmm. from you or having my own garden. Mm -hmm. yes. Hi, I also had a question for Ms. Waters. Um, I know that there are probably a lot of different ways that you can get involved in the food system, like going into actual farming or possibly policy, and I was just wondering if you could give a comment or two about why you chose cooking specifically as a way to contribute. I mean, I did it because I like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I just um, didn't know where to get it, and I opened the cookbook, and I just began doing it. It was really as easy as that. And uh, when uh, Craig was talking about a cook-off, I would like to have a cook-off with him. Because if I've shot properly, I can make a meal in five minutes. That's what I was trying to get. To. I mean, true. <laughs> I can make a meal in 20 minutes that you would love. <laughs> But I can do it without going to Trader Joe's. Okay. <laughs> so I, you know. We're going to have a cook-off. We and are you guys will be invited. <laughs> so my question um, is also, I guess, for both of you. Um, you talk a lot about fast food and, and, and how it's really slowing us down. And I think you're right. There's a lot of, I, I think there's a lot of spirituality that goes into making your own food. And I really love the way you talk about it because there's this deep personal connection. And I was lucky enough to be raised in a family where both my parents really valued home-cooked meals. And so I love to cook as well and feel that connection with my food. But if you could talk a little bit about some of the other... I think social and cultural factors that pervade the use of fast food in our country. And I think a lot of that is overlapped with race and socioeconomic status and how we do have certain segments of our society that just don't live anywhere close to a grocery store or anywhere that offers any kind of fresh produce. And all they have are liquor stores or the corner McDonald's. So if you could talk a little bit about how we can kind of think about we, uh, spreading this, this culture of slowing down and enjoying and connecting with nature but also taking into account that we have certain individuals in our society who are working three to four jobs and their priority is just to put food on the table for their children. Great question. Well, I think one of the big impediments is not knowing how to cook. I mean, when you uh, uh, really learn some of the basics, and I think it's not very difficult at all to learn about them, but I can get a chicken, and I can have three meals from a chicken for a family. But you have to know how to make that chicken stock, and you have to know how to portion the, the chicken so that everybody has enough, and enough of the grains and enough of the vegetables to make a, a meal satisfying and nutritious. And so it's, it's a combination, absolutely, of learning how to cook. And I, I can't help but think that uh, the public school system is the only way that we're going to reach everybody. And if we gave everyone a free, nutritious lunch at school for free, that would be the beginning of a whole change in uh, eating habits. I think it's one of the best questions, and it gets, it's so complex. It gets back to the minimum wage. Why the hell aren't we playing a minimum wage? And um, making this a level playing field. Why can't, when I first started farming, that was my goal, to grow fresh, nutritious foods and get it to the people who needed it most. And unfortunately, where I was in my career, I failed at doing that. I could never deliver it. I just, the two didn't, didn't connect up. And it's still our goal. I think it's our goal in this university. And the fact that we have students here who are food insecure. We have a long way to go. Um, but the fact that we're aware about it, that we're talking about it, that it's an issue, we may have different uh, opinions about it in this room, and we certainly have different opinions about it in California. But, um, you know, in 40 years of farming, I don't think I've faced a more challenging time. 
and yet um, the opportunities are there. And if, if we can vision this change and work towards it together in California, we will get there. Yeah. You know, people have said, has California lost its luster? Hell no. <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're still going to be the leader. We, we, you know, we're the seventh largest economy in the world. Uh, we're the fourth largest agricultural economy in the world. We have a lot ahead of us. Well, I'll tell you, at Harvard, uh, two years ago, they had a conference around food, and they were talking about the drought in California because most of their food comes from California, and they're eating it in Cambridge. Yeah. Now, that was two years ago they had that, that conference, and I'm, I'm, I'm just shocked that we are not further down this, this uh, path of understanding. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I've been grappling with the concept that California supports and sustains the global food system. And I guess I'd like to hear why you think California alone should bear that burden when they themselves are not feeding the state and in a way that also supports and maintains the sustainability and health of the state itself. So. To what extent should California actually be supporting the global food system? And to what extent should it cut back and recognize that the state itself should be a priority, the people that live there and its environment? Uh, that's a really fascinating question. And, and the piece I'm missing in it is the business component, that, that I'm, a, I'm a business person and I'm in farming to do the things that we've talked about here, but I have to, you know, I, I sell a, a, a commodity that is sold uh, internationally. And so are you, are you suggesting that I revamp my business model um, and, um, and change to a different crop or a different marketing structure? How, tell, tease that out for me a little bit. I guess another part of my question, and this is probably, I'm not a business-oriented person, <laughs> if we weren't so driven by making a profit, then yeah. maybe our habits would not be so fast. Yeah. And maybe our habits would be more sustainable, both for the human and for the environment. So my bigger question, I guess, is why does California have to be so business driven and to make a profit when you're selling a commodity that is supposed to be nutritious and sustaining of a food? Yeah. yeah. So Help, help me out here. <laughs> well, I, I'll just help you out in that, um, that if we were willing to pay the farmer the real price of food, they would grow that food for us. And that is really, uh, I've seen that happen on a small scale, but there's no reason why that can't happen on a big scale. We could be, uh, the, the sustainable farmers could be growing for the state of California. And I think that's ultimately where we have to go, that we are growing the majority of the food uh, in the area where we live. No matter where we live on the planet, we need to be growing that food there and teaching people in the schools how to do that mm -hmm. most effectively. I mean, there's always going to be a trade of spices and tea and coffee, but, but the majority of food has to be grown nearby. Don't forget those 58 gallons of water that took to produce the latte. Well, we have to eat differently, at, uh, obviously at different times of the year. We have to have green housing. We have to think about the, the biodiversity of crops. We have to think about a diet that, that is... Uh, uh, um, it can be grown in the place where we live. And I know that it's possible. I know that that is possible. We just haven't put our minds to doing it. Um, so I, I'm a freshman here, and I came from um, northern New Mexico in the Rio Grande Valley. And so there's a lot of sort of local farming there. And I guess just sort of as I've come to an urban area, there's sort of been a, there's definitely been a sort of disconnect with um, the food that's being grown and the food that's being consumed. I sort of 
I know the farmers at the farmer's market. I was talking, I went to the Berkeley farmer's market this weekend. I was talking to my friend about how at home I know the names of all of the farmers. And I guess I'm wondering, um, just for you guys and your personal experiences, I know that, uh, Craig, you traveled around and that, um, Alice, you traveled as well. Just sort of coming to an urban area, what did you do to sort of reconnect with food and sort of what do you view as some of the best ways to sort of connect with your food in an urban environment? Because that's just something that I've, just in my personal life, been having trouble doing. And I was just wondering what your experience was with that. And just, I don't know, just elaborate, I guess, a little on that. I actually had a, a fun experience today before this meeting at the David Brower Center, a um, uh, Berkeley Food Institute meeting. And um, one of the audience members is uh, training beginning farmers right right here, uh, uh, multicultural, multinational. So I can give you that name. Go, go, th so what's happening, you've got growers right here, right, that you can see who are learning, who are producing, um, and you can take advantage of, of them. I mentioned in Sacramento we have urban farms. I think those are, are perfect learning, learning opportunities. Um, so it's popping up in different cities around, around the Northern California. Hi. Hi. Um, I teach pre-K at a small school in the city, working to start up an edu edible education program there. And I wanted to know what you thought about if and when an edible education program exists in every school, what would be the most important lesson to teach to children? Well, I know that the results of 20 years of the Edible Schoolyard Project and, and now it's um, uh, really uh, 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 been the experience um, in many, many schools around the world is that when kids grow food and they cook it, they all want to eat it. Mm. And that is a truth. Yeah. Um, if they grow it and they don't cook it, most will eat it. And, but if they grow it and cook it, they all want to eat it. So I, I just use that as, as uh, my, my, uh, my hope uh, for edible education. Did I, I answer that question? I think we have time <laughs> for a couple more questions. Hi. Um, so my question was, um, and what you, the comment you just made kind of refers back to him saying like busy families not being able to cook. If their children were taught to cook, that could also, people can cook for themselves at an early age, so that would also be helpful. Um, and this isn't more a comment than it is a question, but um, we we're talking about how California produces um, a majority of a lot of the agricultural products that are um, consumed in the States and also abroad. Um, <coughs> And I think that it's important to remember that a lot of other crops are um, subsidized, whereas our specialty crops are not. So in that sense, the burden to bear is very much on the state. Um, and I was talking to Craig about this earlier, but I, I was proposing in an op-ed to start taxing um, exports of agricultural products from California and sort of like a water tax. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure how it would work. I'm not like super economic in that sense, but I was thinking that if it were to hurt the economy, like we we're saying we're the seventh largest economy, fourth in agriculture, um, it would also, uh, we would be able to conserve that water as well. So let's say we're not exporting as much, we're conserving that water. So in a sense, there's two problems solved. Um, and it's not necessarily a question, it's more about that mm -hmm. I think we need to remember the larger problems where um, California is producing a lot So um, therein lies a huge problem of our production here in the state. F fascinating concept. And I think you said that the tax monies would go back either to provide water for drought-stricken communities or to improve our recycling or gray water or to, in essence, uh, promote conservation, right? Yeah. yeah. So one more question. Um, this is a qu oh sorry. Oh, this is a question to either of you. Um, 
I feel like a lot of the time I want to buy directly from a small farmer, but I'm forced to go to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's to buy organic because um, a lot of the time at farmer's markets I ask, is this um, organic? And they say no, they spray it with pesticides. So if you could just talk about why or how we can get small farmers to um, grow or organic and like why they're spraying pesticides and stuff. Want to give that a shot first? <laughs> well, I, um, I really go to farmer's markets where they are really all organic uh, producers. And I think it's terribly important uh, that we make those distinctions and know about it. Uh, uh, I, I have to say that... Um, that the farmers market movement in, in, around the country is sort of growing um, by leaps and bounds. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of markets are popping up. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us as the people who are buying in those markets to insist that the food be pure and right. And I think it's a two, I mean, you know, it's a, we're, uh, uh, Carla Petrini of Slow Food uh, 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 always talks about uh, uh, the producer, not w that we're co-producers, uh, the people who are buying the food and the people who are growing the food. We have to have an alliance together, and I think that's terribly, terribly important that we don't think of ourselves as just consumers. We are co-producers of the food that we eat. And I, I guess that's uh, I think that's a wonderful that. concept to kind of conclude our evening on, is that we are in this all together. Yeah. And it's, uh, we are co-producers and co-eaters. And I think that you've all gotten the rigorous assignment for <laughs> this week. While you're working on this class, you should cook something wonderful and eat it with friends. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Alice and Craig, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.